Hey everyone, Nas here. I hope you've all been doing well through 2022. It's been a pretty rough year all across the world, and I hope you've been managing to get through it okay. It's been a while since I've released a video and I apologize for keeping you waiting. I went through some stuff IRL, and any motivation to cover darker topics dwindled for a bit. But I'm back, and I'm feeling better. I put together a video for all of you, and I plan on doing more going forward. Thank you for understanding and for sticking around. Today I'll be covering 10 missing person cases that have remained unsolved. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Twenty-year-old Abby Lynn Patterson was last seen in Lumberton, North Carolina at 11.30 a.m. on September 5th, 2017. She mentioned that she had to run some errands and would be home in about a half an hour. She left from her home on East 9th Street and walked down the street towards Inglewood Avenue where she got into a brown Buick sedan. Authorities later identified and proceeded with an interview with the car's driver. The driver was an acquaintance of Patterson. They said they dropped her off somewhere else. She has never been heard from again. Her mother reported her missing at 6 p.m. In the months prior to Patterson's disappearance, three women were found dead under unclear circumstances in Lumberton. The bodies of Rhonda Jones and Christina Bennett were found 50 yards apart from each other on April 18th, and the body of Megan Oxendine was found two city blocks away on June 3rd. All the dead women were found naked and in various stages of decay, all of them had struggled with addiction, as Patterson had, and the cause and circumstances of their deaths remain unclear. Authorities stated that there were few similarities between Patterson's case and the other women, and they don't think her case is related to the others. At the time of her disappearance, Patterson was visiting her mother in Lumberton after a stint in a Florida rehabilitation program. She lived in Jacksonville, Florida, and had last lived in Lumberton three years before. Her case remains unsolved to this day. 24-year-old Sarita Lynn Annis was last seen near Clear Creek Road in Crestview, Florida on July 12, 2020. She was homeless at the time of her disappearance, but kept in close touch with her family. She talked to her mother on the phone almost every day. On the day of her disappearance, Annis called her mother and said she didn't like the people she was staying with because quote-unquote something shady is going on and she didn't feel safe. Her mother suggested that she call back in the morning so they could decide what to do about the situation. Unfortunately, Sarita's mother would never receive another call. Annis has never been heard from again, and she left behind the backpack of clothes she normally carried with her everywhere. She also left behind three children. Her mother stated in spite of her mental health issue, and her <laughs> it's not like her to drop out of sight without warning. Sarita and Annis's case remains unsolved. 20-year-old Kayleen Marie Oling was last seen at her friend's home in Aetna, Pennsylvania later in the evening on January 9th, 2020. She left home to meet with her boyfriend, Michael D. Mano, and never came back. At 1.36 a.m. on January 10th, she texted her mom to confirm she'd see her at 9.30 a.m. and that she planned on babysitting her younger siblings while her mother was at work. Oling never arrived and disappeared without a trace. At around the same time, Oling called her mother. She posted on her Facebook account saying Mano had committed a robbery. Within an hour, her account had been deactivated. Since her disappearance, all calls to her phone have gone straight to voicemail and her EBT card has not been used. Mano is considered the prime suspect in Oling's disappearance. He has stated she's alive, that he has been in touch with her, and knows her whereabouts. Unfortunately, he refuses to say where she is or otherwise cooperate with authorities. After her disappearance, he sent explicit photographs of Oling to both her father and her 17-year-old sister. As a result, he was charged with corruption of minors. He has an extensive criminal record, with charges including theft, arson, criminal solicitation, In March 2022, he pleaded no contest to one charge of corruption of minors in connection with explicit photos and sentenced to 6 to 12 months in jail in one year of probation. No charges have been filed in Oling's disappearance, but she's considered to be in danger and foul play as possible. Oling's case remains unsolved to this day. 19-year-old Larry Darnell Stackhouse Jr. 
left his parents' home in the 100 block of Lynn Circle in Syracuse, New York, between 6 and 6.30 p.m. on December 2, 2005. Larry and his friends went to a basketball game at Christian Brothers Academy. When his parents woke up the next morning, their son had still not returned, and they reported him missing. Stackhouse's friends said he dropped him off at a store close to his home, but later changed his story and said Stackhouse got into an altercation with some Native Americans at the basketball game. Many rumors have circulated around that Stackhouse Jr. was killed and that his body was disposed in the Onondaga Indian Nation Territory, but no hard evidence was ever found to support these rumors. Authorities have no evidence that he is deceased, but they consider his disappearance to be suspicious. At the time of his disappearance, he had two misdemeanor warrants out for his arrest, but investigators do not believe this is why he vanished. Several tipsters told authorities he was involved with but his parents do not believe this. He had no criminal record, only traffic tickets. Stackhouse Jr. left behind a young daughter. He worked at a nursing home at the time of his disappearance, and his parents described him as a well-behaved young man who was going to get his GED and wanted to provide for his child. So what happened to Larry Darnell Stackhouse Jr.? Did he get into an altercation with Native Americans at the basketball game? Did someone else attack him? We may never know. Stackhouse Jr.'s case remains unsolved to this day. Fifteen-year-old Kristen Marie Galvin was last seen at her grandmother's house in Spring, Texas on January 2nd, 2020. She has never been heard from again. At the time of her disappearance, Kristen was a good student and on her school's junior ROTC and drill team. She had run away from home once with her boyfriend and was found by police on Bizonette Street in Houston, Texas a week and a half later. Her family believes she was <laughs> during this period. As the Bizonette Street area is noted for its <laughs> investigators believe Kristen may still be in Texas and may have been trafficked a second time. Witnesses reported seeing a photo of her on websites known for advertising <laughs> She may frequent the Bizonette area of Houston, Texas, or she may be in Atlanta, Georgia. For her, it was reportedly seen online in the Atlanta area in March of 2021. She has not been found, and her whereabouts remain a mystery. 18-year-old Corinna Page Slusser dropped out of Bloomsburg Area High School, one class short of graduation and moved in with her friends in her hometown of Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania in 2017. She had been a cheerleader in school and dreamed of becoming a makeup artist. She didn't get along with her mother and hoped to move in with her aunt in Massachusetts in January of 2017. In the summer of 2017, she met a man named Giovanni Pagero, who told her he could give her a place to stay in New York City. She traveled to New York City in July of 2017 taking only her cell phone and ID. She didn't even bother to take any extra clothes. When she got to New York, she would keep in touch with her family and friends, contacting them on a daily basis. She mentioned everything was going well, but after her late disappearance, her family found out she had been working as a advertising on the internet to get clients. At 1 a.m. on August 25th, Slusser called 911 from the Harlem Vista Hotel in Manhattan, New York, and said Pagero, a man whom she identified as a pimp had stolen $300 from her. When she confronted him, he grabbed her by the throat and slammed her against the wall. When police arrived at the scene, she was still very upset, shaking and crying. Pagero was arrested and charged with harassment, third degree assault, and criminal obstruction of breathing. A temporary order of protection against him was issued by the court on Slusser's behalf. When her family in Pennsylvania found out about the attack, she downplayed it and told him that there was nothing to worry about. In September, Slusser's grandfather had passed away, and Slusser agreed to go to his funeral in Florida. But a day later, she called her mother and said her social security card and driver's license had been stolen, and she couldn't fly. She did, however, want to return home to Pennsylvania. Slusser's mother went to Florida for the funeral on September 19th, and Slusser was supposed to arrive home in Pennsylvania the next day. But her mother wasn't able to get in touch with her, and upon her return, she found out Slusser had never arrived in Pennsylvania. Her mother then reported her missing. Although Slusser's family last heard from her on September 20th, according to her family, she was last seen in the early morning hours of September 20th, 
leaving the Haven Motel on Woodhaven Boulevard by 68th Avenue in the Rego Park neighborhood of Queens, New York. Slusser had been very active on social media prior to her disappearance, but after September 20th, all of her posts had stopped. Investigators believe Slusser was controlled by several pimps, and in November of 2018, Ishiko Wani, one of Slusser's pimps, was charged with a woman named only as victim number one. The prosecution alleges that between September of 2017 and November of 2018, Wani used coercion, force, and fraud to force victim number one to engage in and brought her to different states, including New York, for this purpose. He also bought online ads promoting some of which featured Slusser alongside victim number one and offered a two girls special. Between September 10th and September 20th, the day Slusser disappeared, she exchanged over 800 text messages with Wani. They reportedly had an argument on September 20th because victim number one was upset about his relationship with Slusser. Wani said that he would take Slusser to another hotel to give her to another man. She was never seen again. In May of 2019, Wani reached a plea agreement with the prosecution, pleading guilty to four of the five charges against him. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. At his sentencing, Slusser's mother asked him where she was and if she was alive, and Wani replied, Honestly, I don't know. I never passed her off to anybody. Is she dead or alive? I'm honestly not sure, but I pray she's alive. Slusser's disappearance remains a mystery to this day. Forty-seven-year-old Brenda L. Madison was last seen by one of her employees at the concrete business she owned. All text coring and sawing in the 700 block of Spring Miller Court in Arlington, Texas on April 8, 2020. She has never been heard from again. Her personal truck was in the repair shop at the time of her disappearance. And after she was last seen, her company's cell phone, purse, and other belongings could not be located. Madison is a single mother and her loved ones described her as a responsible, dedicated parent and business owner who owned her own home. After her disappearance, her heavy-duty equipment, tools, company vehicles, and backup computer hard drives were stolen from the business. She had an elaborate home security system with cameras inside and outside of her home. But after her disappearance, the camera's hard drives and backup systems were pulled from the wall, and a large heavy-duty safe was missing from her home. In October 2020, the father of Madison's daughter moved into her former home, but Brenda was nowhere to be found. Madison is still missing under unclear circumstances, and her case remains unsolved. 15-year-old Rosalind Velasquez was last seen leaving her apartment in the Azalea Park area in Radcliffe, Kentucky, sometime in the early morning hours of August 24, 2020. She told a friend on Instagram Live that she had taken some pills and was walking outside in the woods. She took her medication with her but left most of her belongings behind, including her chapstick and iPhone earbuds, which she never went anywhere without. She has never been heard from again. According to her mother, although Rosalind liked going for walks late at night, it's extremely out of her character to leave without warning. Her mother stated that Rosalind developed a phobia of other people and became introverted after being bullied. She liked to hide in a walk-in closet in her apartment to cope with her anxiety. At the time of her disappearance, Rosalind was a student at the North Harden High School, attending class from home due to the pandemic. She lived with her mother. Her father passed away when she was five years old. Her mother stated she took advanced classes and planned to go to college and work in the medical field. She enjoyed playing the violin, drawing anime figures, and playing with her cats. Rosalind is originally from Kansas and moved to the Radcliffe area where she has family, two years before she was last seen. She may have remained in the local area after her disappearance. Her iPhone pinged in several different locations in the general area. Little information is available as to what happened to her, and her case still remains unsolved. 34-year-old Danielle Imbo and 35-year-old boyfriend Richard Patron Jr were last seen at the Abilene's Bar and Restaurant in the 400 block of South Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 19, 2005. They had drinks with friends at the restaurant before leaving between 11.30 and 11.45 p.m. They mentioned that they were going to Imbo's home in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Their friends stated that both of them behaved normally and seemed happy that evening. 
Little did they know they would never see or hear from them again. Patron's vehicle is also missing. It's a black and silver four-door 2001 Dodge Dakota or Dodge Ram pickup truck with the Pennsylvania license plate number YFH2319 and possibly a NASCAR sticker with 99 in the rear window. Neither Imbo nor Patron have accessed their bank accounts or used their credit cards or EasyPass cards since they went missing. Their cell phones have stayed off. Imbo's purse and wallet have not been located. She had an appointment with a hair salon at 11 a.m. the next day, but never arrived. Patron and Imbo have one child each. Imbo has a toddler son, and Patron has a teenage daughter. Their loved ones have stated that they love their families, and they wouldn't voluntarily abandon them. The couple knew each other in high school and began dating 10 months before their disappearances, after they separated from their respective partners. Authorities have questioned associates of both people. Patron and Imbo's estranged husband had allegedly exchanged threats with one another over the phone, and Imbo had made multiple failed attempts to reconcile with her husband, who was involved with another woman. Shortly before she disappeared, Imbo told her husband and Patron that she wanted space from both of them. She was reportedly considering ending her relationship with Patron altogether. Their loved ones believe foul play was involved in their cases, and both families have accused members of other family of causing their disappearances. Investigators stated that very little evidence is available to indicate what happened to Patron and Imbo, but they have ruled out kidnapping and think a random act of violence is also unlikely. Their disappearances are being investigated as a double homicide, possibly a murder for hire. Imbo was employed as a loan processor for a mortgage company at the time of her disappearance, working out of her home. She lived on Dunbarton Road in Mount Laurel in southern New Jersey in 2005. Patron Jr. lived in South Philadelphia. Both New Jersey and Pennsylvania authorities are investigating their disappearances. Unfortunately, their cases remain unsolved to this day. Sky Elijah Metawalla was just two years old when he was last seen in Bellevue, Washington on November 6, 2011. His mother, Julia V. Batakova, said he got sick and she was driving him and his four-year-old sister to Overlake Hospital Medical Center in her brother's 1998 Akira when it ran out of gas in the 2600 block of 112th Avenue Northeast. Batakova left Sky strapped in a car seat in the unlocked vehicle, took his sister and walked to a gas station a mile away for help. When she arrived, she didn't buy gas, but instead called a friend who dropped her off at the car about an hour after she'd left it. By this time, Sky was gone. He has never been heard from or seen again. An extensive search of the area turned up no indication of Sky's whereabouts. Authorities did find a toddler's shoe, but later determined it wasn't his. Batakova did not have a gas can with her when she called the police at 9.50 a.m. to report her son's disappearance. Police learned that the car had not in fact ran out of gas and had no mechanical problems. Witnesses said they seen the car between 8 and 10 a.m. and there wasn't a child in it. Batakova refused to take a polygraph or speak directly to the police about her son's disappearance, communicating through an attorney instead. The rest of Skye's family members, including his father, Solomon S. Metalwala cooperated with the investigation, and Solomon has been active in the search for Sky, whereas Berakova has not been. The couple separated in 2010 and were in the process of a bitter divorce. Both sides accused the other of abuse and they sought protective orders against each other. In December of 2009, while the Metalwalas were still married, they were cited for reckless endangerment for leaving Sky then three months old, unattended in a car on a 27 degree day. They agreed to take parenting classes, do community service and spend a year on probation. And after they'd fulfilled these requirements, the case was dismissed. The court had forbidden Solomon to have any contact with his children, and he hadn't seen either of them for almost a year before Sky disappeared. He claimed that Berakova suffered from long-standing mental health issues, including depression, an obsessive compulsive disorder that caused her to neglect her children's needs and herself. She spent time as an inpatient in three mental health facilities. Berakova said Solomon had anger problems and was verbally and physically abusive to her. She also made multiple allegations that he had abused the children. They were later ruled unfounded. Investigators learned no one besides Berakova had seen Skye for at least two weeks before his disappearance, and possibly much longer than that. 
but it wasn't uncommon for her to isolate herself in her home with her children for extended periods of time. She also habitually left her children alone in the house, notably for 11 hours a few days before Skye's disappearance, while she went through a long mediation session regarding child custody. They agreed to let Berikova have custody and give visitation rights to Solomon. But less than a day later, Berikova said she changed her mind. In the aftermath of Skye's disappearance, his sister was taken into protective custody and placed in a foster home. His sister was too young to provide any statements useful to the investigation. She only said her brother had been in the car that morning. Solomon was allowed supervised visitation with her, and after six weeks got custody of his daughter. In March of 2012, Solomon Berikova's divorce agreement was finalized. He got sole custody of both children, and she had no visitation rights. Following Skye's disappearance, Berikova began seeing Alan J. Morgan and ultimately married him. Their relationship was troubled, there were incidents of domestic violence, and Morgan was jailed for violating a no-contract order against Berikova. He continued to violate the order by making at least a dozen phone calls to her from jail. In the summer of 2015, Berikova gave birth to Morgan's son. Child Protective Services sought custody of the baby, alleging both Berikova and Morgan were unfit parents. Solomon believes Berikova was responsible for their son's disappearance and thinks the custodial dispute has something to do with it. He stated he thought Berikova might have given him to someone else to hide him. Although no suspects have been named in Skye's case, the investigation has focused primarily on Berikova due to the circumstances of the case and her lack of cooperation. She was born in Russia and has relatives outside of the United States, and Solomon is from Pakistan, but authorities believe Sky is still somewhere in Washington state. The circumstances of Skye's disappearance are very unclear, and it's possible he went missing some time before his mother reported it. I feel bad for Skye, going missing at such a young age. He would be 13 now if he was found. Sadly, his case remains unsolved. Every time I research these stories, I feel so much sadness and pain, not only for the victims, but for their family and friends as well. From young kids to adults, people unfortunately go missing, leaving people desperate to seek answers. If you or anyone know anything about the cases talked about today, please contact your local law enforcement. Any information you are able to provide would be an incredible help for these people trying to find closure. I hope that these victims are able to come home safely. Thank you for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.